welcome back to Think Tech. Think Tech, community matters because community matters is why. And also music matters. Today we're gonna to talk about Chamber Music Hawaii. And we have Barrett uh, Hoover. Uh, he's on the bottom of the screen. And we have uh, Jim Moffat, he's on the top of the screen. And uh, Barrett, Barrett is the um, executive director of Chamber Music Hawaii. Uh, and Jim is, uh, is a director actually, and a long time member. And he's a member of the orchestra, God bless him. And every time I walk into the opera, I see him there and I wave at him and he waves at me and improves my experience incredibly. <laughs> glad to hear it. We're well, glad to see you, you there. I watch you during the production. I, uh, and, no, you have, and you've requested no refunds yet. We hope that <laughs> we hope we have that experience again soon, Jay. I, I miss that I do too. greatly. Well, now can you guys take a moment and say hello to our viewers? Hi, viewers. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> um, great it's great to be here, Jay. Thanks for having it us is. on uh, in these difficult and strange times for performing arts ensembles, uh, where we're all trying to figure out what what's next and what, how to do things differently. Um, it's it's completely changed, so we appreciate being able to talk about it. Yeah, well, necessity is the mother of invention. You've already invented some new things, and uh, one of them is the the word for the day. And I don't think anybody out there knows this word. This word is, is fermata. Yeah. Fermata. So <laughs> what do you guys tell us? What is fermata? That, what is yeah. that? Yeah, we're, we're taking a fermata. It's a pause. It's a musical pause in the music. It can be an elongated, elongated note or elongated uh, rest. And um, that's what that's one of our, our board members coined that term. We're, we're taking right. fermata here. So that's a nice way to put it. So Barrett, how'd you get to be uh, doing what you're doing? How'd you get into this? Were you born as a prodigy, like Jim? <laughs> no, oh, no. Yeah. Oh gosh. No, if only. <laughs> um, I was at Hawaii Opera Theater for about 12, uh, yeah, about 12 years. Um, and I've recently transitioned to a full-time job at Leeward Community College running the theater out there. And I heard that CNH was looking for a general manager, which is a part-time position. So I was told, and, um, and <laughs> I thought that might be a fun thing to add to my plate. So it's something that I've been doing for a lot for this entire season. This, this, this season has been abbreviated, however. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. I'm not off to a good start. Did you We're know something? Non time. <laughs> <laughs> and Jim, well, yeah, you were born a prodigy, right? Oh, no doubt about it. Can't you tell? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Never had to work at it a day in my life. You've been, um, you've been doing music work for a long, long time. Uh, yes, that's true. I first became a professional musician back around the time of the U.S. Civil War. And uh, uh, <laughs> you mean and, it's still uh, going on? Close yes, to, close, it's still yeah, going right. on. <laughs> well, that's true, but that's another story discussion. But uh, yeah, about 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 forty-seven years now since I became a member of the American that's Federation right. of Musicians and worked professionally. So yeah, yeah. long time. Yeah, my I'm reaction to that is music must keep you young. Yeah. Definitely, can't you tell uh, that too? <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I joined Chamber Music Hawaii Spring Wind Quintet in 1986, having joined the then Honolulu Symphony in 1981. Uh, well, you know, music has a different role in the time of the COVID, I tell you. I mean, I, I've kind of rediscovered it as a personal experience. Uh, I take my uh, Android for a walk. I put a, some uh, headset on, you know, and I just flipped through all the things I ever wanted to listen to. And the, the, the people in the neighborhood think I've lost it because I'm humming and singing and whatnot <laughs> right on through. But I find it very, I find it very tonic to have the music so personal this way. I know the kids do this all the time, but their choice in music is a lot different than my choice in music. <laughs> on the other hand, you know, whatever you like really helps you. And um, I think that's a discovery for me. And I, I don't think I'm alone about that. I think a lot of people are rediscovering, you know, the personal relationship you can have with the music you like. You're listening to more music, recorded music than you did before. Yeah. Yeah. Amazon music, the like, you know. Yeah, yeah. And anything you want, and it, it, it often tells you what you want. <laughs> 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 the power of artificial intelligence. Yeah. Sounds like it's a conductor. Yeah, <laughs> it's, ev it's everything you know if you look back i, I think um, what's but part of that for me anyway is that 
um, when you're when you're alone, uh, I'm not alone. I have my family, but when you're you know holed up um, and you're you know in a lockdown situation, you tend to integrate your life. You tend to think of things that you haven't thought of for a long time. Um, you know, your life is. Uh, it's introspective, it's retrospective, more than it is in the average workday when you've got other things on your mind. And so one of those things for me is, is music. For example, I went to school uh, with Simon and Garfunkel. They were my buddies in class, you know. <laughs> one day they, they asked me if I wanted to join their singing group. And I said, no, 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 no. I've got to go to law school. Don't get in my way. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Talking and to somebody the rest who's is history. I might have been a contender on this. <laughs> <laughs> you still are, Jay, in our opinion. <laughs> but I think music has assumed an even more important role, it, not only with its ability to make an intimate experience for each person during this time, but the importance of the necessity of having it there is just elevated with all this, which I think is terrific. Necessity, uh, that's that's an important word. I mean, we've, we've yeah, had a number so. of shrinks on the program and we've asked them what it's like for people to be holed up. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of stress there and it, it creates tension in the family. It, it creates personal tension. And uh, uh, I worry about that over a long period of time, but you can ameliorate that kind of tension with music. That's why you, got, you guys are so important and it's important that you continue to produce even at a time uh, when you have, you know, the uh, problem of social social distancing. Right. And so I hope people are realizing how much of a, a dark spot it, in their lives there is right. when there's no live music and, and that they'll come back to it after this is all over and, and really come support it full force um, more so than they did before, right. maybe. Hopefully with a deeper perspective of the necessity yeah. and the importance it brings to your entire being, so. And the yeah, community you have, sharing it with audience members, other musicians, all that kind of stuff. Well, let's let's talk about live music as opposed to recorded music. My, that's my the Android, only kind there is, <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> but tell me what you know. What is what is the difference? Uh, I, I know this is a long a long discussion, but what is the difference between one and the other um, to the musicians, to the audience, to the community? What is the difference? Well, uh, well recorded music is is the recording of a live event of some sort, whatever it was, whether it was in a studio or a live concert or something. A live concert is a one-time experience. Even if it's recorded and played back that way, the um, intimacy, no matter how big the your performance space is, of you re reacting in the moment to what you are hearing and experiencing which includes everything, not only the music you hear, but how the performers are doing it or how your audience members are experiencing it with you. That's a once in a lifetime thing that is gone when it's over, whether it's recorded or not. And so that's, um, that's just, this is obviously something very special. So. Yeah, I would just add to that the audience, um, you know, being in a room full of people experiencing the same thing at the same time, it can't be replicated any other right. way. And right. it's true in any genre, theater, classical music, jazz, you know, people, audiences experiencing things together is what makes going out and experiencing live performance special. Definitely, without a doubt, yeah. no matter what your genre like. And also any is. recording is not a true representation of, of what, it's, it's a different medium and it's a, it's right. a powerful medium, but, you know, pr commercial recordings are highly edited, so you're not you know the perfection is more uh, a key to to that than than in a live perform everyone strives for perfect for protect for perfection but you know there's a lot of editing involved in, in recorded music definitely definitely yeah, i had yeah. i had one one uh, years ago an engineer talking about a recording he was doing with a world famous artistic ensemble and he said they were mainly going measure by measure yeah. and recording things that way and then splicing it all together of course in my case it should be note by note but still it's like it's like it's not as barrett said it's not um it's not what really is or what really lends itself to the emotional depth of the experience so well I, i'm reminded of a thing that i that i learned at hawaii public radio is when you now this is radio not it's not, it's not visual but it's radio <clears throat> when you're listening to a live broadcast on radio 
You have to listen for the breathing because the breathing is, a, is another method of communication and it, it, it has an emotive <laughs> aspect to it. Definitely. And, uh, and that's live radio. And, and then when you get, when you get to, you know, somebody speaking now, speaking live, that's a whole other dimension. And I suggest it's the same thing with music. I'll, yeah, I'll tell another brief story about my brilliant recording past. But we, I was helping a producer edit a recording of mine many years ago. And we realized that when we cut in the phrase that we were going to use on the recording, there was no breathing for the for preparation when we play because we we're all wind players. So we had to find a, a spot where you could hear us breathing and put that in there. No, so it sounded really? boom and away we went. Yeah, so you're right. And that's uh, that was a, a funny thing. And actually that recording was in the finals for a Grammy award. So I guess the breathing just really made it happen. So uh, there you go. So you're right, Jay, that's very true. The human element, it's just a, another example of the human element, what, what has to happen. What about the mistakes? What about the mistakes? You know, it's, it's very exciting to hear something where people are capable. It's like live theater. They're capable of making a mistake or sure, live opera just, for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that something, is it good? Do I want something where there's a possibility of a mistake? Well, just come and hear any concert I play and you'll have ample opportunity to that. But I think, <laughs> I think I once worked with a sports psychologist on this and he said that part of the thrill of live performance as a listener or a performer is that it's like a race car driver. You're, you're on the edge and anything can happen. So I applaud performers who take things to the limit if they don't quite make it. Most of them do because there are so many brilliant performers. But I think that all adds to the excitement and the audience senses all that kind of stuff. Even if you might think you they don't or something, they, they do and you can tell by their reaction. So Yeah, why well, do I remember there was an opera sense. with a small dog in it one time? Well and that was uh yeah. I that was the two thousand production of, of Barber Seville. Yeah. Am I right to remember that everybody was sitting in the audience, a couple thousand people, all wondering whether the dog would poop on the stage? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, and that, and that I, I assume it's the same event that I remember. The dog came on stage at the wrong time. It just <laughs> got away from the backstage people and it came out. It was and the, the French actors, bulldog, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. and it, were you at the, a working no. man? No, but there was, was a fantastic. portrait of that bulldog hanging in the bathroom at the HHC <laughs> offices for the longest. It was time. great. It was great because <laughs> the actors, they they went, they immediately improvised. It was fantastic. Mm. And then the person, I don't know if the person who was supposed to be in charge, but someone, a character in the in the opera came on stage <laughs> pretending that the dog had gotten away from him and <laughs> called after it and it looked at him unbelievably and followed him back off and then the actors went back on that was so fantastic in fact the conductor at that time mark flint he tapped his baton on the stand and went bravo bravo because <laughs> it was it was so great it was fantastic <laughs> fabulous but i also remember that dog because when the cast would come out to bow they would all go forward and then they would lower the lights and allow them to, to back up and come back out for another bow. And the dog couldn't figure it out. So when the lights would come back up, it was always the backside of the dog facing the audience. And then he'd figure it out and turn around just in time to have another blackout for the, the So yeah, the, those, those the, the things roar of the grease, the roar of the, uh, the, the roar of the grease paint and the smell of the dog. Exactly, that was fantastic. <laughs> now, was now fantastic. what about Chamber of Music Hawaii? I mean, it's just kind of a- I've heard of it. it. <laughs> well, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, uh, a, a mini, you know, it's a small set right. uh, and it does yeah. small concerts and it has a smaller number of musicians than, a, than the full orchestra and all that. And, right, right. But it's, but it's very important. Tell me where, where it fits, Barrett, in, in the, uh, you know, the environment, the music environment um, of the state of the performing arts, performing musical arts. It fits um, right in with the performing arts because it's such an important part of, of classical music that not everyone is aware of and familiar with. The, you know, people listen to the big symphonies and the operas, but chamber music is one of those things that's it's like symphonic music on, on a more intimate scale. And there's so much great chamber music that um, I think it's such it's just as equally as important as all the other 
uh, genres of, of classical music. What is chamber music? Uh, Jim, you want to feel that one? Music for a, a small room or a chamber. That's where the name originally came from. Yeah. Whether it was in aristocratic circles or amateurs getting together on their own, it's how it became known. I've still look at, I still get some um, music, some old printing that says music for amateurs or professionals. So uh, uh, many people I think still do not, maybe it's more of a lost art, but a lot of people get together and play chamber music on their own, even when they have vastly different careers from professional musicians. And as far as the importance of it goes, I think, I mean, everybody's got their own opinion and that's good, but there are scholars that might tell you, for example, that Beethoven's greatest works are his late string quartets, something like that. You know, he wrote those amazing symphonies among many other things, piano concerts. So it's, it's um, a very important. I'm thinking uh, of Mozart, Mozart, Mozart uh, in the same vein, a uh, chamber music person. He was a tremendous chamber musician as well as composer of, of chamber music, mm -hmm. no doubt about it. You know, I, I've always wondered, maybe you can help me now. I, you know, I, I learned so much on these programs talking to guys like you. Um, so <laughs> if I'm looking at a chamber music concert, I'm thinking, gee, what's the relationship of a chamber music musician and a musician in the orchestra? Um, is it that um, the really good guys in the chamber music uh, get to be in the orchestra or au contraire, that the good guys in the orchestra get to be the, the musicians in the chamber music. Uh, which way does that go? I think it goes <laughs> any way you want it to go. It's, it's on a, lot, a wide variety of things. One of the great cellists, who did a lot of chamber music, great um, soloist, Carter Bray. He's now principal cellist of the New York Philharmonics. And, but, so it can go that way, it can go other ways. I mean, there's the chamber music Hawaii was started by musicians in the then Honolulu Symphony, who were not the principals in the orchestra. They were seconds or assistants, so they didn't play as much on the uh, major works all the time. So they, they wanted to play more and they founded these different groups. They founded a woodwind quintet, another set of musicians founded a brass quintet, and then finally a string quartet. And they realized they should work together to, um, achieve more success and more stability. And that's how it got started. So that's how the Chamber Music Hawaii ensembles were founded. I think it, it's up to whatever people want to do to make great music. So you suggest that there's a quartet, this quartet, that quartet, this, there's various ensembles, is that the way it is? Did they mix and match on this? How do they divide themselves? Uh, in up? Chamber Music Hawaii, uh, the Springwind Quintet founded itself first back in 1974. Then the Honolulu Brass followed, and then ultimately the Galliard String Quartet. And they were uh, applying for grants that they realized they could all benefit from. And they realized further that having one of a type of an umbrella organization supporting all three of those ensembles would help greatly. And so that's how they formed Chamber Music Hawaii. And those three ensembles still drive the organization today. So those groups perform as those groups. You saw the Galliard on the on the video that we all love. And we do a wide, such a wide variety of, of things. Sadly, one of the concerts that we were supposed to do in May this, mo this month was the original 1920 score to the Mark of Zorro with the original film in the background. That's wow. for 11 players. So we have members of the brass, woodwinds, and string quartet working on something like that to play. And if we need extra people, we have them. We have great, highly qualified colleagues in the orchestra that we draw from, and it's just really terrific. So Barrett, you know, before COVID, what kind of schedule did Chamber Music Hawaii have? What, what were you doing? You know, how, how are you getting out there? What kinds of concerts or recitals were you doing? We do concerts every month. Uh, every, uh, every month is a different ensemble, and we'll do two or three uh, performances of each concert. So we have our series at the Doris Duke at the uh, Museum of Art and uh, a series at the Polyku at Windward Community College. And then uh, I forget how many times, six times, three. Uh, three times a season, we go out to UH West Oahu. Um, so pretty, pretty active um, for all of our groups. All of our groups get lots of playing time. Uh, each ensemble gets about two concerts a season. And then 
as Jim mentioned, if we have programs that are larger that require different groups, different mixes of groups, then we'll do programs of those as well. And those are called our Trace Ensemble concerts. Uh, Trace Ensemble, I love that. <laughs> and that was invented by one of the founders of Chamber Music Hawaii, Bill Lightfoot, to just mean that uh, members of all three groups were playing together, not separately. And in addition to what Barrett mentioned, we have a very active education outreach program Absolutely. throughout every island that we can go to in the state every year. Oh, a trace ensemble will be on the final exam. And uh, so, so will oh. Fermata, by the way. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I've plowed yeah. through many Fermatas in my career. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. Now we're so hoping to do about, that What about neighbor soon. islands? Have you, have you traveled? Do you go out there? Yeah, that's what I was saying. Our, our education program reaches all the neighbor islands that we can reach. Um, so that's a very active thing, something the musicians like to do. And we are also often presented by neighbor island presenters. Uh, one of our great partners is the Hawaii Concert Society in Hilo. They present a number of concerts. We're working with them right now and something for this coming season. And we've taken a wide variety of groups to the various islands, depending on need and depending on desire. And it's really great because we can, we have the flexibility to work with presenters on what they need and, and whether also educationally we do that too. For example, there's a, 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 a string program on Molokai and they really benefit from having Galliard go over and work with them. So mm -hmm. it's really a helpful thing. And we've done so, so many other things too. Sorry. Well, you know, so here we are in the time of COVID, you know, and um, we, <laughs> so I've heard. So yeah, we all we're examining everything to, to see how our, our world is being transformed, like it or not. Um, yeah. But you guys, uh, you know, you had to cancel concerts in March, April, probably May. Yeah. Uh, who knows, June or July or after. But you did do this thing with, um, uh, I guess it was the. Uh, the the Koolau uh, program, right? The Koolau uh, string quartet, and we want to play. We want to play that. Galliard, us, Galliard, Galliard, Galliard. The Galliard. Uh, can you give us the background of how that got started? I mean, obviously, that was something that's very creative, uh, very innovative, and using Zoom or whatever you use, you were able to create some some real, really fine music with the musicians all being in a different room. That's remarkable, and, and, and what it, it tells me is that uh, maybe there's a future for that sort of thing, like it or not. It's not exactly the same as a live performance because they're in different places. They're coming on electronically, but it works well. How did you come up with that, and how did you execute it? Well, the trick that all arts organizations right now are trying to figure out is how to keep engaging with their audience you know, without performances. And so um, we've seen a lot of groups putting out different content and uh there's a lot of content out there that people are putting out some good some not so good and um we wanted to send something out to to offer to our our patrons and our our fans and so um we put out a call to all of our musicians to to all of our ensembles to to create something on their own so they didn't have to come together and um the golly art string quartet was the first to to respond to that they all sent me their their individual videos uh, of them playing the same piece, and somehow they nailed it. They they really nailed the assignment, and um, I I put the I edited this video together about them all playing separately, and it all it came out beautifully. I thought so. We put that on our website and our social media pages, and um, yeah. Yeah, can we can we take a look at it? Let's take a minute and, and look at yeah. it. I we have a little time for that. Let's let's play it now, and you can see. Uh, what these guys did.
that touches my heart. It's great. <laughs> yeah. There's they there's a whole album of those uh, songs that they, the Galley Art recorded almost 30 years ago now, in fact, over 30 yeah. years ago. But okay. Barrett put that all together. Thanks, Barrett. Terrific job. Yeah. So Barrett, were they it's, all uh, playing at the same time? Uh, or did you play them individually and then put the clips together? They were they played individually. I believe they they I'm not sure who played who recorded first and then they played uh, to to one of those other uh, musicians. Um, but yeah, they they played in when I first envisioned it, I thought you know they would all play to a metronome and kind of keep the same time and then, hopefully it would work out in the end that doesn't always work out in the end as we discovered <laughs> trying to do that with the spring wind quintet right. they, they picked a, a march um uh, which was a little bit uh jauntier and, and quicker and, and had more more 16th notes and things and so it was a little more challenging it didn't quite work out so but we'll be not, back we'll be yeah, there yeah, yeah. <laughs> keep stay tuned we'll have some some more content out but it's not yeah, always no. the easiest thing to do to do well no, but I think after a while, you'll really get good at it. You'll be able to do it uh, off the back of your hand and the musicians will love it and so will the audience. And it's uh, one of those things that we learn in the, in the process of responding to the, to the COVID, like it or not. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking forward. Too much. Yeah, hopefully we'll get back to live performance before too right, long. Right, that's what we're all do too many of these. <laughs> yeah, what's your target now getting back? Do you have any sense of it? We're, uh, we're planning next season, so we're still moving forward with a, a September opening, um, hope, hoping for the best. I, I truly hope so. Yeah. And, when, and, when you have, um, and when you have that reopening, you'll have a coiled spring of enthusiasm. <laughs> they will come from miles around, Thank and that'll you. be just as touching. <laughs> that will be. I agree. In fact, I already have that coiled spring. I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, funny thing, Jim, is you've, you've always you've always had that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're right. No, so, Barrett, can, you, can you leave? Yes, we have. Barrett, can you leave uh, some fa final words, parting words about Chamber Music Hawaii and about music and about, you know, music in our community with our listeners? Uh, sure. Things you'd like them to remember. Yeah, well, I think I, the reason I wanted to get involved with Chamber Music Hawaii is because I really think it's a gift for our community. Um, it, it, it increases the exposure of our local musicians to the community and gives them, gives them more opportunities to play and get out there and show what they're great at. And um, it's, it's unlike anything else that we have here. And it's so important to support and it's so important to keep the music going. And we hope that everyone um, you know, checks us out if they haven't. If they're not familiar with, with Chamber Music Hawaii, go to our website, chambermusichawaii.org. Um, we're hoping to have uh, some new content on there soon, and we'll, we'll announce our next season when we can. And of course, you can sign up for our mailing list and donate uh, if you like on the website as well. Sure. And the, and the name of the website, chambermusichawaii.org. Chamber hmm? That's right. Yeah. Well, I hope you'll tell us uh, when your when your schedule solidifies, uh, and we'll maybe have another discussion about this. Um, and, I, and I really, I'm not kidding when I say I think there's a coiled spring, just like Jim. Uh, you know, who will, everybody will come down. Jim, your final words to our audience. Um, you know, you're you're so full of enthusiasm and music and grace. Tell them what you want them to remember. I want to remember that live music is an incredible experience, and I agree with you that people re will really want it even more because of where it's fit in this situation and they're going to realize, and they already do, everyone knows what we are hoping to bring back to them live soon. Yeah, well, you know, although we did this, um, you know, on Zoom and, uh, you know, uh, uh, such as it was, we did, we did the Galliard. Um, if, can you imagine how much better it would be if it was in our studio? And I'm no offering doubt. you an open offer to you guys that if you ever want to come down to our studio, I mean, when the coast is clear and perform live, we will carry it anytime, anywhere. That would be That's great. Awesome. We'd come down now, but we can't play with masks. So we'll <laughs> wait until everything reopens. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe no, the string quartet can play. String quartet, good. That's true. <laughs> think about that. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, Barrett. Thank you, Jim. Great to talk. Thanks, to Jay. Thank you, always Jay. great to see you. Always Next great time. to see you. The same here. Let me show us. Aloha. <laughs> see you soon. Aloha. All right. <laughs>